Insurance doesn't have to be a headache. Hodinkee Insurance is the fastest and easiest way to protect the watches you love. So, what are you waiting for? Sign up today. If you stop and think about it, there aren't all that many possible variations on the design of a watch, especially when it comes to case shape and case geometry. I mean, your options are basically round, square, rectangular, oval if you're really pushing it and feeling especially frisky, but all of them are basic, regular geometric shapes, which I guess could be described by relatively basic mathematical equations. And then we have the Cartier Crash. The Cartier Crash is a watch that is basically impossible to mimic because it is a truly unique design in the history of watchmaking. There has never been anything like it since the first crash watches came out in 1967. Why the Cartier Crash has become such a revered watch and why it's become such a highly desired one is a question that you can answer only partly from looking at pictures and only partly from reading other people's descriptions. To really understand a design, especially one that is as subtly sophisticated as the crash, there's no substitute for personal experience. And that's why we went out and got one. This is a week on the wrist, the Cartier Crash. Before we get into the experience of actually wearing the Cartier Crash and what it told me about the design, let's talk a little bit about what the inspiration for the Crash might have been. Now, there are a lot of people who think that the Crash must have been inspired to some degree by a very famous painting by the surrealist Salvador Dali, which is called The Persistence of Memory. And uh, draped across different objects that are in the painting are soft watches, melting watches. They look as if they were made out of candle wax and they've been exposed to a little bit too much heat. Now, whether or not this painting inspired the uh, crash is open to debate, and I don't think it's a debate that's ever gonna be closed. For one thing, there are some differences between the melting watches in uh, Salvador Dali's painting and the design of the crash, the most significant of which is that the watches in persistence of memory have Arabic numerals on them rather than Roman numerals. Still, I think it's reasonable to uh, surmise that it's definitely maybe possible that uh, persistence of memory partially inspired the design of the crash. If you move a little bit forward in history, the legend that I heard and that many people heard for many years was that the crash was the result of an actual car crash, hence the name. And the story goes that some gentleman in England, driving an extremely powerful motor car of some type, we don't know who it was or what the car was, got himself into a fiery fatal accident whilst wearing a Cartier watch. In some versions of the story, it's a tank by Noir. And the impact of the crash and the subsequent heat of the fire that engulfed the wreck are thought to have melted the watch, to have deformed the case so that it takes on the shape that you see now in the modern crash watch. What actually happened is a little bit more mundane. Jean-Jacques Cartier, who was running Cartier London at the time, and Rupert Emerson, a watch designer who worked there, put their heads together in 1967 at Cartier London, and they decided that they would do a watch that was a little bit more au courant, a little bit more appealing to a crowd that might find traditional Cartier watches a little too square, so to speak. The question that we're trying to answer here, of course, is what is it actually like to uh, wear a Cartier crash, uh, especially for a relatively extended period of time? And the answer is, it's kind of a weird experience. Now, normally I wouldn't say that um, the Cartier crash and the Rolex Daytona have anything in common at all, but one thing they both uh, do have in common is that they are both watches with so much cultural freight and so much cultural legacy and so many associations with them that it's very hard to actually see the watch. You put it on for the first time, you experience it for the first time, and what you're really seeing is something that is not only uh, very valuable monetarily, but also very, very iconic from a design perspective. I've probably looked at hundreds of photographs of Cartier crash watches over the years. I had never quite noticed just how elegantly sinuous the shapes of the Roman numerals are and how perfectly they play against the contours of the case. I'd never noticed before just how asymmetrically symmetrical the watch is. It actually exists not on a strict center line, but uh, almost on a diagonal, which you can see uh, stretching from the 12 o'clock position down to the six o'clock position. The uh, center line of the watch is actually canted slightly off to one side. This is counterbalanced by uh, the bulge that you see 
between uh, six o'clock and nine o'clock, which pulls the watch in the opposite direction. So while the origin legend of the crash might lead you to expect something quite chaotic, what you've actually got is something extremely carefully thought through and extremely calculated where nothing has been left to chance. In terms of comfort, while it wears larger than the actual dimensions might make you think, it's still a very, very comfortable watch to wear. It's a very easy watch to wear. It's not a particularly easy watch to uh, tell the time on when uh, light gets dim, but to evaluate the Cartier crash by the same standards that you would evaluate a Rolex Submariner is to kind of dramatically miss the point. The intentions of the crash are to be a wearable art object and to express the concept of elegance with uh, a certain amount of humor as well. Now, normally when we do a week on the wrist, we like to talk about the competition for the Cartier crash. The problem is with the crash, I really can't think of any relevant competition. I mean, there's probably a wider variety of watches available from a design standpoint now than ever before in the history of watchmaking. But the problem is there isn't anything like the crash. And if you want a crash, there isn't some other watch that you can look at and say, oh, I want to crash really badly, but this other watch, this other design scratches the same itch. It's just, the crash has something going for it that no other watch does. It has actually become cool. Uh, we've got people like Tyler, the creator, wearing one and apparently very sincerely enjoying it on a regular basis. This is partly a function of the internet. I don't think a watch like the crash uh, would have become the kind of phenomenon that it has become if it weren't possible for people to see it. So what you have is this real tension between its exposure and its relative rarity. And uh, that, of course, just makes people more interested. I absolutely loved the crash before I had a chance to wear one. I love it even more now that I had a chance to wear it. I see things in its design that I didn't see before. The funny thing about the Cartier crash is that it could be the most dated watch of all time. In 1967, with so much else going on, I mean, uh, you know, op art, pop art, popular culture, the explosion of youth culture, free love. It is uh, probably true that there were a lot of things people were more swayed by, influenced by, and interested in than 12 kind of wacky looking watches made by a luxury boutique in London. But with the passage of time, a lot of the cultural detritus that existed around the same time as the crash was introduced have kind of fallen by the wayside. And we can see the crash for what it is, which is uh, one of the most entertaining, interesting, and um, I'm forced to use the word, chic watches of all time. Mm -hmm.